Let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to the book of Habakkuk, chapter number 2. Book of Habakkuk, chapter number 2. Habakkuk lived during a time when God's people weren't like they should be. They were, he was living in a nation that had been blessed of God. We're living in a nation that's been blessed of God, amen. But sin was rampant, wickedness was rampant, violence was rampant. Hey, that sounds a little bit about like us, don't it? Uh, I, think it's, I think it's a good thing for us to be in an area like this. He's got some questions for God. We, you know, he ought to know that judgment was coming. And we ought to know too that judgment's coming. I mean, you don't kill 60 million plus babies and think that you're going to not face some judgment. Just not. Um, and so, you know, for us to take a look at the situation and say, well, this is not fair. You know, why is God doing this to us? Why, why is God allowing this to go on? Uh, we've got Habakkuk syndrome. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Habakkuk wanted God to do something. What, what he wanted, he wanted revival. He didn't want judgment. Yeah. But Judah had gone too far. Judah had gone so far that God was going to have to chastise them before revival comes. And when we get to the next chapter, revival is going to come. Okay. I assure you, it talks about revival in chapter number 3. But not before they're carried away into captivity for 70 years. Yeah. We've seen that we can have confidence in the Lord, though, because of His Word. The Lord will do all that He says He will do. And because the Lord will do what He says He will do, what are we to do? We're to live by faith. And that's what we were looking at last week. The just shall live by faith there in verse number 4. Behold his soul, talking about the, the Chaldeans that were going to be coming down upon um, Judah. Uh, they were going to be lifted up, which is lifted up. His soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. You know, these were going to be some prideful folks that were going to be coming down, and they were going to think, boy, our gods have given us the victory. No, the Lord God gave you the victory. Because he needed you to judge his people. But you're not going to get by with your wickedness. And so that's what we're going to see tonight. Is that God judges sin. God judges sin in heathen nations. God judges sin in his nation too. And he'll judge it in the life of those who have sin in their life. But we as the just, what are we to do? We're to live by faith, aren't we? And Habakkuk was part of the remnant. Part of the faithful remnant that tried to live for God. And the Lord answers Habakkuk here. Remember his question. What about these wicked people, the Chaldeans, that you're going to use to judge Judah? What are you going to do with them? Are they, are they going to be uh, punished or are they going to go unpunished? Surely you're going to judge them too. In the rest of this chapter, the Lord gives a series of woes that we want to look at tonight for, for Habakkuk to deliver. Not only were these delivered regarding Babylon, but some of these also applied to Judah, as well as really any other nation and even individuals that exhibit these characteristics. These woes are pronounced against sin. So let's pick up, shall we? And we're going to... Uh, pick up in verse number 5. I'm just going to read as we go along. We're going to, Lord willing, finish this chapter tonight. But uh, we're just going to read verses 5 through 8 to begin with. Because we see the, these woes of the wicked are detailed here. And understand that the word translated woe that we're going to see is an interjection of distress pronounced in the face of disaster or in view of coming judgment because of certain sins. And that word translated woe that we're going to see is used frequently by the prophets. You'll find it 22 times in the book of Isaiah. You'll find it 10 times in Jeremiah and Lamentations. 7 times by Ezekiel. 14 times in the Minor Prophets. So let's look at these five woes detailed by the Lord to Habakkuk. Verse number 5, we see there's the woe to thieves. 
Verse 5, Yea, also because he is transgressed by wine, he is a proud man. Neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Shall not all these take up a parable against him, and taunting a proverb against him, saying, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. In other words, in the end, when the Lord has his judgment on these people, and that woe is upon them, because of what they'd done, these folks that they had done this to, that's what they would say. <laughs> Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. How long? And to keep him lateth himself with thick hay. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for booties unto them? Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. So there's a woe to thieves here. Those that woe to him that increases that which is not his. As how it's put there in verse number 6. In Babylon, there would be a path that was full of greed and thievery. When Babylon came forth as an empire, it was never satisfied. It was conquer and go out, and, you know, and they had great amounts of spoil that they would gather, and, and they'd go conquer somebody else. They'd do the same thing. And that's the way the world is in general. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse number 10 says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. You know, you know of anybody that has enough? Yeah. We're supposed to be content with what we have. But uh, the Babylonian Empire in its conquering and reigning was always gathering and collecting more and more for itself from that which belonged to others. It wasn't theirs. Did they need it? No. But they were like a vacuum cleaner, just sucking up all the booty that they could get. All the nations and the peoples around them, they invaded them, defeated them, and ripped their wealth away from them. Babylon made itself rich by carrying out material pursuits in such a way that it shut out all other concerns, such as mercy. They didn't have any mercy when they went in to defeat people. Their mind was on gain by whatever means and measure they could get it. Verse 7 and 8 that we read there basically talks about this coming back to bite them one day. And that which they did to others would be done unto them by some of those very nations that they did these things to. So there's a woe to thieves. Secondly, we see in verses 9 to 11, there's a woe to the covetous. Verse 9, Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people, and hast sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Uh, what caused them to be thieves? Thieves was this matter, this covetous spirit that they had. You know, um, seeking their own exaltation to the detriment of others. It was all about building themselves up. In other words, you know, I'm, I'm, that belongs to me. And it didn't belong to them. They went after it. And then when they get it, nobody's getting mine. Uh, these were wrong desires, they were worldly pursuits. It's the attitude of, well, I've got mine. I'm not worried about anybody else. It's every fellow for himself. And they exalted themselves with their pride. And it's an idea of, no, I'm not sharing what I have with anybody. And, and they didn't. They are characterized by a heart that is lifted up within them of self-exaltation. And that's pride. They... They not only sin against others in this, they also sin against themselves in this. They are all about uh, four people. I, me, my, and mine. 
It's all about, all about self. And to elevate themselves, the Babylonians would trample others down. Their building plans included the ruin, the, the cutting off is how it's termed there in, in the Scripture, the cutting off of, of many people. It, it's this, in this they sinned against their soul. If there was no one around to personally testify against them, the stones and the walls and the beams out of the timber and what they would build would stand in testimony against them. That's what it was talking about there in verse number 11. For the stone shall cry out of the wall and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Now, if, you know, uh, they, we don't belong here. We were wrongfully taken. So there's a woe to the thieves, there's a woe to the covetous, then we see a woe to the murderers. Verses 12 through 14. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and established a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the, the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for their vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now let's think about this. Babylon would use a path of blood and slavery to build their empire. However, all the things that Babylon would do to all the nations it conquered, it was going to come to an end. There was an end to it all. And all the things that Babylon would build would also come to an end. And historians tell us so we, you, you, the Babylon, the city of Babylon and the wall around it was, you would think it would be impregnable. The immense capacity of it. 15 square miles with 350 foot high walls. I want you to imagine that. 350 foot high walls that uh, were 87 feet thick. They could actually put six chariots along side by side and run along, around the the top of the, the wall there around Babylon. And the walls extended 35 feet below the ground to keep the enemy from tunneling through. Um, there were 250 watchtowers, 53 temples, 180 altars to Ishtar, who was the goddess of fertility, love, sex, and war. Isaiah in chapter 14 describes this great city of Babylon as the golden city. But believe it or not, it had a weak point. The weak point was when they built the wall, they allowed the city, the, the river, excuse me, allowed the river of Euphrates to flow freely through the city. It came through the city. That's how they got their water. And so... Uh, that was the weak point. The city was built, though, and exalted by slavery and blood and death. We can look in the book of Daniel, and we, I'm not going to take time to turn there tonight, but you can read in, in Daniel chapter number 5, read the downfall of the Babylonian Empire where King Belshazzar was drinking and partying with his wives and concubines and others using the sacred vessels that had been brought to Babylon from the very temple of God. Think about that. They were drinking to the gods of wine, the, 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 the uh, gods of gold and the gods of silver, or whatever gods they can think of. They were just having a good old party time, drinking, drinking, drinking. And we're going to be talking about drunkenness here in a little bit. Because <laughs> this mentioned here too. But while they were drinking, there came a hand writing on the wall. He didn't understand what it meant. And... Daniel was called. Daniel read the words there and gave the understanding of what they meant. And they had the meaning that Belshazzar had been weighed in the balances and he was found wanting. And that very night, as they were drunken, the Medes came through. While they were in their drunken mockery of God, the Babylonian Empire came to an end at the hands of the Medes and Persians in the end, all their efforts and works came to an end. Understand that they diverted the river Euphrates, came through that way to get in. Belshazzar was killed that very night. Verse 14 here reminds us that one day Jesus 
is coming. I like there, verse number 14, there's going to come a time where the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. There's going to come a time when the Lord reigns. You know, all that junk's going to end. You're not going to have the empires like the Babylonian Empire or the Medes and the Persians or the Grecian Empire or the Roman Empire. You're not going to have those. You're going to have King Jesus on the throne in Jerusalem. That's what you're going to have. And the glory of the Lord will be known across the world. Um, we see the fourth woe is uh, actually begins talking about in verse number five. Uh, I want us to see there's a woe to the manipulators, and when why by manipulators I'm talking about those that manipulate others through the use of uh, intoxicants, whether you be talking about wine or whatever. Um, look at let's look at verse number five first, because it tells us, "Yea, also because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man." So there's the first mention of wine. Look, skip down to verse number fifteen. <clears throat> to woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that put his thigh bottle to him, and maketh him drunken also, that thou mayest look on their nakedness. Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered. The cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee. And shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. For the violence of Lebanon shall cover thee, and the spoil of beasts which made them afraid because of men's blood, for the violence of the land, of the city, and of all that dwell therein. Just think about this. We see the, the, that intoxication was their path to manipulation. Intoxication was used to entice others to sin, but it was also wound up being connected to their downfall. Don't you like the fact that they fell the night they were had the drunken party? What do you think else was going on at that party at the same time? We see here how it speaks that to the fact that alcohol gives way to sexual sin. You remember Noah after the flood, he got drunk in his stupor and he exposed his nakedness to his grandson. Remember how Lot's daughters got him drunk and committed the sin of incest. And I wonder how many of the 60 million plus babies that have been aborted since Roe versus Wade were conceived because of intoxication. And people got drunk. You know, not of drunkenness and it happened. And then they wanted to get rid of that baby. Now according to verse 16, the Lord would see that this was this that they had gloried in and celebrated and would bring them shame. The cup that they had to drink of was the Lord's right hand, and that's a figure of divine judgment and retribution. Um, they were disgraced and shamed, did come their way as the Medes and Persians invaded them and took over while they were drunk. Now, verse 17 speaks of what we might term in our day as what goes around comes around. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> um, is. Their shameful stripping of Lebanon. Lebanon was known uh, for its cedar trees. And basically, when Babylon took over that area, they stripped Lebanon of the cedar trees. And while they were stripping the land for the cedar trees to build Babylon, um, they killed the wild beasts. The Chaldeans cut down the timber and killed the wild beasts and their assault on the land. And the Lord would hold them accountable for the, their violence against both the land and the beast and the inhabitants of the land. Can you imagine having such a beautiful land and having desecrated in such a way? We see next there's a woe to the idolaters there in verse number 18. <clears throat> What profiteth the graven image that the maker thereof hath graven it, the molten image, and a teacher of lies, that the maker of his work trusteth therein to make dumb idols? And you may just think about how silly 
that idea is of making an idol. Whether you make it of wood, or whether you make it of silver or gold, whatever you make it out of, you're making it. And then you're bowing down to it. <laughs> or you, or you, you're worshiping it. And that's what we think of we, when we think of the practice of uh, idolatry. That's what we think of. Let, look at verse number 19. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, Awake, to the dumb stone, Arise, it shall teach. Behold, it is laid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Now, now think about this. We think of the practice of adult, idolatry, and we don't think, uh, you know, it really doesn't exist much in our day in, in our land, but it does. Um, not wood and stone, necessarily. Uh, we think of the practice of idolatry, our mind goes to people bowing down to an idol made of wood or stone, and that, that type of practice of idolatry was more common in those days than it is now. But it's still around the world. It's still around in some places. But that doesn't mean there isn't idolatry of a whole other kind, for there surely is. And God's the, the sin is the sin of idolatry. It's, it's not the idol itself. Okay? It, it is, in essence, placing more value on something else other than the Lord. The essence of worship is placing extreme value on something. What you value determines whether you are an idolater or not. And is there anything in your life that comes before your worship of the Lord? If there is, that in essence is an idol to you. That's, that's idolatry. Now the point of this woe is to emphasize the one true God and the valuing of Him above anything and everything else. Babylon would serve the creature instead of the Creator, as did many of the heathen lands. I mean, idolatry, you, as we were going through the, book of, of the king, books of the kings and Samuel, uh, we, we went through 1st and 2nd Samuel, we're now we're in 2nd uh, Kings. Uh, we've gone through there, and we know that idolatry was rampant in the nations round about, right? We just got through uh, recently talking about, we were spent a long time on Ahab and and uh, Baal uh, was a big thing with Ahab and Jezebel. Well, that was just one of many gods. One of many gods that were during that time. And the thing is, is uh, uh, Babylon just did what really others in heathen lands were doing, and that is serving idols. But listen, it was prominent in Judah too. When we get through with the book of Kings, when we get toward the end, we'll see that this time that Habakkuk is talking about comes in. That's when Chaldeans come in. Babylon comes in. They determine they're going to serve idols. Well, God's going to let you, uh, let you be carried away into captivity. They sought their own substitute, which demonstrated their own ignorance of reality. They served gods of their own making. They were gods made in their own image. How sad. And God was going to judge Babylon for their idolatry, but not before He used Babylon to judge His people for theirs. This last verse. It said, But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. When you look at this and you study it out, it's like the Lord is saying, shut your mouth. Seriously, shut your mouth. Who? What, whoever thinks that the Lord is oblivious to all that's going on in this world, who, whoever puts something else before Him, just shut your mouth. Uh, the point here is that sin does not go unpunished. Thievery, covetousness, murder, manipulation, drunkenness, idolatry. It's all under the all-seeing eye of the Lord of the universe. All that's happening in our land right now, the Lord sees. He does. That was true for Babylon. It's true for Judah. 
and for every other nation in this world, including our own United States of America. So, what do we need to do? In the time such a, that we live in, like I said in the begin with, he lived in a nation that had been blessed of God, should have served God, but they weren't. That's why God's judgment was coming. What did the, what did the faithful people do that do serve God? You still live by faith. And you stop complaining. You stop doubting. The Lord's not in, indifferent to sin. He's not insensitive to suffering. The Lord is not inactive or impervious. He is in absolute control. In His perfect time, He's going to accomplish all His divine purposes. You're not going to stop it. I'm not going to stop it. Uh, and so Habakkuk was to stand in humble silence, hushed expectancy of the Lord's intervention because the Lord is going to have the final word. He's going to have the final word with the U.S. of A. too. Amen. And we need to pray for our nation. We do. And we need to work to try to uh, see revival in our nation. I'm not saying that we don't. We do. But when things don't go the way we expect, as we are the just, it's time to trust. It's time to live by faith. There's no time for compromise. Or no time for pushing God off. No time for falling away from the things of God. You know, the, the remnant needs to stay faithful. Amen? You need to stay faithful to God. Draw, draw nigh to God, He'll draw nigh to you. It's time for us to open our hearts and listen to the Lord. So I hope that in this, when, when we go to the next chapter, chapter number 3, in fact, I just want to take a look here at the very first two verses and see uh, just a glimpse of what we're going to be taking a look at next week. A prayer of Habakkuk here. And verse number 2 says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. In wrath, remember mercy. Now, the Babylonians did not remember mercy, but the Lord does. Amen? Amen. So, in the midst of, of wrath, in the midst of, of what the Lord is doing, if you'll stay faithful to the Lord, and you draw near to Him, you'll be better off for it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank You so much for Your love for us. We thank You for the words of encouragement uh, that You gave to uh, Habakkuk. I know this is not what he wanted to hear, Lord, but uh, it's what he needed to hear, and it's what we needed to hear. And Lord, I just pray that in these desperate times that we live in, as we see uh, uh, cities on fire uh, being destroyed by folks that have no love for you at all, and no love for us at all. People who are um, Lord, full of wrath, and they're full of fierceness, and uh, thankfully they're far away from us at the present time, but they could be in our towns um, before we know it. Well, we, as, as things uh, crumble, Lord, help us to look to You and have You as our King, have You as the Lord of our life, have You as the first, having the first place in all things as believers. And Lord, uh, um, trusting You to do the right thing for us and praying for Your soon return. As we prayed earlier, we pray even so come Lord Jesus. Lord, Help us with these truths now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>